um, you're you're treading on history here, so tread tread lightly, because um, it is a really amazing building. It has quite an amazing sort of pedigree. Um, originally, well, sorry, the original building that was here was built in 19 between 1935 and 37. Um, it was part of uh, an expedition. It's called the British. Uh, yeah. British. Um, it was part of the British Graham Land expedition, and um, this was. Um, depends which history book you read. But as a Brit, I'll give you my kind of version of it. Um, but officially, this was Britain's attempt to take possession of Antarctic territories. You know, bear in mind, this was a time when you know the British Empire was in full swing. Um, it was nearing, you know, its heyday. It was almost coming to, to, to its end, really, um, which occurred after the war, the Second World War. But um, those were the times. So Britain came down here, and they literally staked their claim. The flagpole is still outside. Okay, the Union Jack used to fly from that a long time ago. And just around the corner to the left, you can't see it from here, but around the corner there's a sign, a big signpost. It has the original name for this part of the world, and it was called British Crown Land. I saw the sign, the wood. It's just a wood piece. A wood so, that's right. So back, back in those days, whenever <coughs> territories were, were, uh, were, were, were taken uh, on behalf of the Crown, um, they were called on either a dependency or a colony or something like that, and uh, they came under British, uh, the British Colonial Office. And one of those colonies, or one of those overseas territories, was the Falkland Islands. So the Falkland Islands government really managed um, the expedition that came here in the first place. So by 1937, after some amazing groundbreaking um, uh, scientific research conducted here, um, how do you take possession of a territory? How would you do it? You can't just come and plant a flag and say, this is mine. <laughs> so how do you take possession? Do you live here? Do you have to live here? What else do you have to do? Have babies here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, one, that's one way. Well, you need to know what you're taking possession of and the extent of it. So, of course, they brought planes down here and they were overflying the peninsula, all the islands, and they mapped everything as far as you can see around here and created some of the most accurate maps of the peninsula. Therefore, you you know you can then go to the Chilean government or whichever government and say, this is British Crown land. It's ours. We mapped it. Yeah. That is how you do it. So, uh, we weren't the only ones involved in this kind of business. Um, when Nazi Germany came into into being in 1938, they sent an expedition to the other side of the peninsula, Gosh. about a thousand miles from here, uh, quite far away, and they also staked their claim. It was called the Schwabenland expedition. And they, they came down for a couple of weeks with this huge seaplane and they were throwing Nazi swastikas out of the window. <laughs> um, literally marking um, this huge territory. And bear in mind, you know, this, okay, you know, National Socialism, as, as nasty as it was, uh, you know, these expeditions were groundbreaking in their own right and they, they achieved an incredible feat in terms of exploratory work. Um, but the reality was that there was actually quite a lot of concern back home, especially for the Allies, because down here we have the whaling fleet. These were the two main whaling fleets that provided oil, food, lubricants, and um, the same oil and lubricants can also be broken down and turned into munitions, okay, into nitroglycerin. You can use, you can stabilize it, turn it into high explosive. And of course, there was a war coming, so. Uh, in 1939, the war kicks off. Um, you know, the immediate response, especially for us Brits back home, was to defend our island nation. And uh, we had the battle. Of, well, for, after the Battle of France, we had the Battle of Britain, and we we're really trying to, you know, keep our little nation going. And, uh, and of course, we we pulled through. And then the U.S. came to our assistance in 1941. And by 1943, we were having a pretty good chewing. From, from Europe, you know, from Nazi, Nazi Germany. So there was real concern that the Nazis were going to come down here and they were going to, uh, they were going to potentially attack the whaling fleet and make use of the ships, the oil, 
and also the whaling station at Deception Island. Okay, they've got huge oil tanks up there. So, uh, a secret operation was put together. Mm. And it was called Operation Tavern. It's top secret, only a handful of people knew about this at the time. It was named after Parisian nightclub, uh, Tabarine, uh, the Tabarine nightclub. And um, they came down in these ships, they came down in warships, established a whole series of bases, base A, base B, base C, there's a whole bunch of them. This is, this, this is base F. And, um, and of course, the enemy never came, right? So uh, a lot of what the men did down here was scientific. You know, they, they looked at the weather, they looked at the rocks, the ice, the penguins. And um, by the end of the war, in 1946, the secret operation, you'd think, after the demobilization of all the troops, they would have just cancelled it and brought everybody home. Well, no, because the work they were doing was just as Charcot had said in his, you know, when, when we were at Port Charcot, he left that, he left that message for all those people, you know, yeah. in future when you come here, our discoveries are for mankind. Yeah. Yeah. So there was this feeling that we had to maintain our presence here for the benefit of mankind, just as Charcot proposed. So, um, so what's interesting Sorry. there is in, in 1946, the government officially transforms the secret operation into the Falkland Islands Dependency Survey, which came under colonial office. And uh, they actually carried on doing the science, you know, keeping an eye on the weather. And this time they started to really realize the importance of what the Antarctic really was, and that is, you know, it's eating heart of the planet. You know, this, is, this is the largest weather factory. This is where the world's weather is controlled from, practically. That certainly contributes to you know how the ocean currents work and how weather behaves in the north. So by 1959, the Antarctic Treaty had been drafted. And in 1961, it came into force, and that is when the British flag was officially kind of lowered down because territorial claims were no longer recognised. Wow. But the science had to be maintained. So of course, the British stayed. And they stayed until 1977, until uh, this place closed down. Uh, officially, this hut actually closed in 1954, but it was kept going as, a, as an emergency refuge. And um, and it's amazing what they what they did here is really you know, it was truly groundbreaking at that time. And uh, eventually, it became British Antarctic Survey, which is now a leading uh, institution, you know, a global institution that contributes to. The, you know, the advancement of human knowledge. Uh, you know, the ozone hole was discovered down here by them. Oh. And this base contributed quite a bit towards that. And that's why it's a historic monument. This is just a very small piece of this enormous puzzle of, you know, why do we do research? You know, we keep hearing about all these research bases, but why bother? You know, well, it's, it's, Sorry, for sir, it's for us. It's for us. I'll give you the history piece again yeah. in a moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm already going to go through Sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's no problem. No problem. Um, so um, that's why that's why the research is here. It's for you. It's for your grandchildren, for their grandchildren. That's the importance of this. And it began in places like this. You know, so just as I said at the beginning, you know, tread lightly because you're treading on on the history that these people have left behind for us to you know look after. Um, the building is looked after by the Antarctic Heritage Trust, based in Britain. It's one of two. There are only two organisations uh, that look after buildings down here. The other one's the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust, uh, which is based... They, they actually look after quite a lot of huts on the other side of the Antarctic. Captain Scott's hut, Shackleton's hut. Um, but this one, this one's a... It's one of the smaller ones. It's not the prettiest one. But there's a little bit of history in every single book you see and... You know, even the coffee can, if you were to you know, very carefully lift that coffee can off that shelf, you know, you can still smell the uh, the ground coffee that these old boys used to drink in that chair right there, mm -hmm. listening to the radio in the BBC World Service on shortwave. You know, uh, it was quite an, it must have been quite an amazing time to be alive, really. And, uh, you know, the modern age, everything's kind of shrunken, we've got the internet now, we've got Wikipedia on the ship. But, uh, you yeah, these guys were a long way from home. A long way from home. And it's a really amazing story. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool to think that they lived here.